Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I would be grateful for short and succinct questions and answers, please. Question one, Alex Johnston. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the regional allocation of funding by Creative Scotland to support cultural events. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Creative Scotland's funding decisions are a matter for the Creative Scotland Board and the recent decisions made for regular funding followed a robust assessment process. The Scottish Government accepts these decisions. Difficult decisions had to be made as there were applications worth £212 million for an available budget of £100 million. Uh, more organisations have received funding for three years than ever before. It's that stable funding that allows organisations to plan and deliver with a greater deal of security. 20 organisations are new to three-year funding, 26 move from two-year funding to three-year funding, and 31 move from annual funding to three-year funding. I'm pleased that Aberdeen Performing Arts, uh, City Moves Dance Agency, Devon Arts, Dundee Contemporary Arts, Dundee Repertory Theatre, Hospital Field Arts, North East Arts Touring, Peacock Visual Arts, Scottish Dance, Theatre and Scottish Sculpture, Sculpture Workshop and Woodend Arts in the Members' Parliamentary Region have been funded. Uh, as part of the assessment process, Creative Scotland looked to achieve the best geographical coverage as possible. Many thanks. Alex I Johnson? Th I thank the Minister for her answer, but it has been revealed that Creative Scotland has removed all permanent support uh, sources of funding for the Sound Festival based in Bankery. This means that it would appear that there is now no Scottish Government support uh, ongoing for any music festival taking place between Edinburgh and Lerwick. Does the Minister understand my concerns about the regional allocation, which seems in this case uh, to support a central belt bias at the expense of the North East? Well, I would point out that Woodend Barnd, uh, one of the organisations behind the Sound Festival, became regularly funded uh, for the first time uh, to a tune of £400,000. Uh, the Sound Festival is funded to March 2015 and has £52,000 of trans transitional funding and is eligible to the £150,000 per project funding that is available at this point. And his point about uh, music festivals and the availability between Edinburgh and Lerwick, I would point out that there are a wide range of music festivals between between Edinburgh and Lerwick, uh, large-scale uh, commercial events such as Tea in the Park, mm -hmm. to free events such as the Dundee Blues Bonanza, um, Creative Scotland fund the Orkney Festival, the St Magnus International Festival, the Neil Gow Fiddle Festival, the Mendelssohn and Mull Stonehaven Folk Festival, which the Election member will be familiar with, with Belladrum Festival. Tartan Heart Festival, and the Hebridean Celtic Festival. So perhaps the member might want to reflect not only on his cultural experience, but also on his geography. Many thanks. Question to Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what arts and culture events it has planned for the West of Scotland parliamentary region. Let's say. The Scottish Government is not directly planning arts and culture events in the West Scotland parliamentary region. Indirect support for arts and culture events, however, is provided through public bodies such as Creative Scotland and Visit Scotland's event directorate, Event Scotland, who are supporting arts organisations and venues who hold events in the West Scotland region. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, respond, that, that response and uh, does she agree with me that uh, locations such as Inverclyde and Western Bartonshire with its rich cultural and music scene uh, would actually be excellent locations for more events to be hosted and will the Scottish Government assist in promoting both Inverclyde and Western Bartonshire as locations to help showcase Scotland's wider cultural offering? Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, as part of the homecoming uh, celebration throughout the year, there are events taking place all over Scotland. Indeed, uh, also in relation to St Andrew's uh, weekend and the winter festivals, he makes a good point about showcasing particular music in different areas. I think uh, the regular funding that's been announced of £600,000 for three years to the Beacon Arts Centre in Greenock um, from 2015 to 2018 also, I hope, will provide uh, opportunity for music and theatre and arts um, in the Members region. Many thanks. Question three in the name of Jackie Bailey has been withdrawn and the satisfactory explanation provided. Question four, Dr. Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made on, an an, on establishing a film studio complex. Secretary. Uh, we are committed together with our partner Scottish Enterprise and Creative Scotland to secure a permanent uh, film studio for Scotland and will make an announcement as soon as possible. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. You will know that this has been an aspiration in Scotland for many years, and there are suggestions that the uh, studio, film studio complex could be opened as early as 2017. Can I ask, in that uh, favourable circumstance, how uh, the Government and its partners can ensure that the benefits would be realised at locations throughout Scotland, including the many fine locations in Dumfries and Galloway? Secretary. Yes, yeah, she's right to identify that it's not just the uh, availability of a film studio. We have the uh, Oki uh, development currently operating in Cumbernauld, where Outlander is working from. But it's also about production, development, promotion of um, our fantastic scenery. And I know there have been a number of productions in the south of Scotland. I'm very conscious um, that we have to promote all of Scotland and indeed the wonderful light which is in the members constituency in that area is very attractive not only to artists but also in a number of um, uh, a number of productions I, I distinctly remember a thousand acres of sky was something that was produced um, in the members area so I'm very conscious of that but I'll remind Scotland of the, the great availability of wonderful scenery uh, but also re reflect on the wonderful talent and skills that we have that we want de to de be deployed here in Scotland uh, when we uh, have the opportunity to develop further our proposals will announce them to Parliament. Many thanks. Question five, Roderick Campbell. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government following the recent G20 meeting. Mr Humza Youssef. Scottish Ministers have not had any discussions with the UK Government uh, Ministers following the recent G20 meeting. Unfortunately, uh, the UK Government has not consulted uh, the Scottish Government on any area of devolved competency before or after attending this important international conference. We continue to urge, of course, UK Government Ministers to consult regularly uh, with Scottish Ministers on issues uh, that affect the Scottish people. Rick Campbell. The Minister will be aware that the G20 only belatedly included a statement on climate change in its communique. You'll also be aware that the Prime Minister suggested everyone has to bring plans to reduce emissions ahead of next year's international conference on climate change. Can you advise what involvement the Scottish Government will have in contributing plans for this conference? Mr. <coughs> Of course, we welcome any additional pressure being exerted by the Prime Minister and the UK Government on other G20 uh, countries when it comes to the reduction uh, of the mitigation uh, and, and, and mitigation of the effects of climate change. Uh, this Government, the Scottish Government, has an excellent record on climate change. We are halfway to our 2020 target of 42 per cent emission cuts, uh, having achieved 26 0.4% uh, cut in 2012. In the run-up to, to Paris, we'll continue to work with the UK Government and the Climate Group, which is the international body that brings government and business together to push for an ambitious global deal on climate change. Uh, we expect that Scottish Ministers will have a place uh, on the UK delegation to Paris. Thank you. Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. Well, one of the key areas on the G20 agenda for 2014 has been infrastructure and investments. Does the Minister agree with me that adequate infrastructure is paramount for sustainable growth and investments into small and medium-sized companies, and that an integrated infrastructure plan for the Highlands and Islands would be appropriate in the spirit of the recent G20 meeting? Minister. Well, I, I salute uh, the members uh, managing to get the North East, quite rightly, uh, and other regions of Scotland in there uh, in terms of a question about the G20. But, I, of course, sustainable infrastructure is uh, an important feature uh, this government wishes to promote. I'm sure uh, the appropriate minister will be delighted to, to, to meet with the member to discuss that. But he's absolutely correct. Uh, when it comes to uh, the climate change agenda, uh, the world uh, has to abide by uh, infrastructure, transport, all these issues uh, are incredibly important and across portfolio uh, in government we work very closely as Scottish Government Ministers but I'm certain uh, that the member uh, will find a very uh, welcome and uh, an, an ear that is willing to listen to, to what he has to say in that regard. Thank you. Question 7. The name of Jeremy Media has been withdrawn and a satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question 7. Neil Bibby to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to promote the, the use of fair trade footballs. Minister Humza Yusuf. Uh, I note the Member's uh, ongoing interest in fair trade and fair trade uh, footballs, uh, and I wish to put that on the record. Uh, the Scottish Government also recognises uh, the value that fair trade footballs have in ensuring that we highlight the needs uh, for workers in developing countries to be paid a fair price uh, for the goods and the uh, efforts of their labour. As a demonstration of our ongoing commitment to fair trade, uh, following our achievement of fair trade uh, nation status in 2013, something the member uh, welcomed at the time, uh, we're providing core funding to the Scottish Fair Trade Forum, who are working with Bala Sports to raise the profile of fair trade footballs across Scotland. 
I thank the Minister for that answer. I know, like uh, me, he is a keen fan of both football and fair trade. Um, earlier this week, I spoke with Ballast Sports, a, a new cooperative here in Scotland uh, that has already sold 1,000 fair trade footballs this year. In our discussions, we spoke about how procurement could be used to encourage the purchase of fair trade football and the issue of how they could be promoted through our schools. Uh, the Minister may also be aware that I have organised a local fair trade football tournament in Paisley in the past, and recently I have been discussions with fair trade supporters about the possibility of organising a national fair trade football uh, tournament, given that Scotland is now uh, a fair trade nation. Can I ask the Minister if he would be willing to meet with myself and Bala Sports to discuss these issues and other suggestions about how we take forward the campaign for fair trade football? Minister? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, of course I would be uh, more than willing to, to meet. In the the member's correct. Uh, both him and I have played in the same team. It might, not be the, it might be the only time that we're on the same team, possibly, but uh, uh, we played in the same team, uh, in which I should say we beat the MPs 4-3. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was just an aside. I won't mention the fact that I also scored at Celtic Park. All of that's uh, put to the side. Uh, the substance of your uh, question, uh, first of all, I think it's very important that schools are involved. Every school that I've ever visited has a fair trade programme. More and more schools are getting, having a fair trade programme, so I think it's imperative we involve our, our, our young uh, people in Scotland on this. Uh, and in terms of uh, a wider national football tournament, I think it's an excellent idea, and I'd be happy to see uh, how we're able to support. So, of course, I commit to a meeting to the member, uh, along with Bala uh, Sports, to see what we can do to progress this important agenda. Many thanks. Question 8, Alex Rowley. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what percentage of goods sold in Scotland can be considered fair trade, and what is it doing to increase the sale of fair trade goods? Minister. Thank the member uh, for the question. The Scottish Government remains committed to ensuring that producers in the developing world uh, achieve a, a fair price uh, for their goods. As I was saying uh, in the previous question earlier this year, I announced a further £442,000 to enable the Scottish Fair Trade Forum to strengthen support for fair trade across all sections of society, from sport all the way through to, of course, fair trade produce. Figures from the UK show that retail fair trade sales were £1.7 billion in 2014. That's roughly 1% of the UK groceries market overall. As major retailers and manufacturers trade on a UK basis, there's no disaggregated figures uh, that exist for Scotland. However, the last survey and the latest survey indicates that fair trade continues to enjoy strong support, with 63% of the Scottish population regularly purchasing fair trade products. Alex Riley. Yeah, thank the Minister for his response. As Scotland is only the second nation in the world to have been declared a fair trade nation, can I ask the Minister if he agrees with me that the Scottish Government can do more to promote fair trade in public procurement contracts in light of the new EU Public Procurement Directive voted for on the 15th of January this year, which makes it easier for public sector bodies to buy fair trade goods? Mr. I thank the member for the question. I would say uh, to the member that uh, the Scottish Government has always seen this as an important imperative agenda to push and to promote. And we've had, uh, thankfully, a, a cross-party uh, consensus on that, and we'll continue to do what we can. Of course, governments can always uh, do more, and we'll, we'll look to do that. But uh, for, so the member knows, there's been substantial uh, improvements in terms of awareness of fair trade over the last year. Uh, additional communities uh, that have been uh, fair, designated fair trade, additional colleges, uh, more percentages of the population reported uh, to be buying uh, fair trade, but of course uh, more to do in terms of the procurement. I'm aware of the change in the, the new directive uh, that's come forth. I'll certainly be talking to the appropriate minister and government to see uh, what we can do. But there are other avenues. Uh, legislation, of course, can be an important tool. And we saw that how working with businesses, even before they get to the procurement stage, was very important in terms of fair trade with regards to the Commonwealth Games, uh, where we saw gold that was sourced. Uh, many of the uh, that was sourced uh, in a fair trade manner. Uh, we also saw uh, many of the products being used in the athletes' village that were sourced in an ethical manner, and that was done by working with companies before they even got into the procurement process. So there are certainly elements of uh, what the member says that I'd be more than happy to take up with the appropriate government minister. And I extend uh, the same offer that I extended to his colleague that I'm more than happy to meet on these uh, issues uh, if he so wishes. Thank you. Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. Um, can the Scottish Government do anything to help ensure that fair trade benefits the very poorest in developing countries in light of recent accusations that fair trade certifications are a path too narrow for least developed countries to tread at present? Mr. I, mean, I think it's an excellent question uh, from the member. It's one that's, uh, I think, dogged the fair trade debate since the fair trade uh, movement uh, began. Uh, but I have every confidence uh, in the fair trade certification. I know they 
themselves, the fair trade, those who, who are involved in the fair trade marking and certification, are very aware of the issues that the member brings up. And it's important that throughout that supply chain, uh, through all the noble intentions that everybody who buys fair trade has, we don't disadvantage the poorest in the world. So we're very aware of that. In terms of what the Scottish Government can do, certainly we can aid those discussions. We can be an exemplar uh, in terms of those discussions. And again, uh, I'm more than happy to, to, to meet the member to discuss and even organise, if he wishes, and arrange and facilitate a meeting with the Scottish Fair Trade Forum so they can give him assurances, additional assurances, to those that I've given. But I can tell the member that they are very, very aware of the important issue that uh, he raises. Thanks. Uh, question nine in the name of Ken McIntosh has not been lodged and there has been no explanation provided. Presiding officers would be grateful of an explanation by the end of the day. Question 10, David Torrance. To ask the Scottish Government how it protects and supports sites of historic importance. Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, this Scottish Government protects and supports the historic environment in many ways. We have worked collaboratively to develop our Place in Time, the first ever historic environment strategy for Scotland, which sets out a common vision and ambition about how we will protect and support our historic environment over the next 10 years. I have convened a strategic forum to oversee and drive the delivery of the strategy and its aims. Through Historic Scotland, Scottish ministers work closely with local authorities, landowners and communities to protect and enhance our country's historic environment. Historic Scotland also administers grants for historic environment projects on behalf of Scottish ministers. This amounts to some £14.5 million a year available to help enhance and promote the historic environment for the benefit of our communities. Thank you. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. The Weems Caves in my constituency is a site of great historic importance. The Save the, the, Save the Weems Caves Ancient Society has worked tirelessly to preserve the unique Pictish artwork found on the caves' interior walls, but the caves remain at risk from coastal erosion. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise what progress has been made on offering support to Weems Caves to help provide security and stability for the future of the site? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Weems caves are, are quite, quite remarkable um, and indeed after the member had a, a member's debate he invited me to, to visit and I've seen first hand the remarkable um, uh, work and art, artwork that's in the caves and gave me a real kind of sense of the vulnerability um, of the Weems caves. The, the group that was brought together, a management group covering local partners, saved the Weems Ancient Cave Society, Five Council, Five Coast and Countryside Trust, the Weems Estate, who are the owners of the site, advised and supported by Historic Scotland and also Scotland's Coastal Archaeology and Problem of Erosion, um, are taking forward five recommendations of a report um, that was put together last year. The five recommendations are to jointly resource a management plan, to provide support for a feasibility study for a cultural centre, to develop better integration between local and national bodies for long-term coastal management between the East, Weems and Buckhaven, to complete the scanning project for the caves and for main government partners to work together to empower local groups to deliver key management aims. I know um, David Torrance um, is passionate about the Weems Caves. Uh, I also share his anxiety about the immediate threats in relation to some of the uh, coastal work that's taking place around Fife and the implications of what that might have um, over the next uh, few months and into spring next year. So I've asked government agencies to try and identify some immediate um, issues, but also to drive forward this management plan. I think more people should be aware of the Weems Caves, and uh, I thank the member for drawing it to Parliament's attention. Any thanks? And we uh, concludes those portfolio questions, and we now move to questions on infrastructure, investment and cities. Question one, Margaret McCullough. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it's promoting the living wage as part of its anti-poverty strategy. Sir Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government fully supports the living wage campaign and recognises the real difference the living wage can make to the people of Scotland. That is why we funded a pilot by the Poverty Alliance with the aim of increasing the number of employers across all sectors in Scotland paying the living wage. I am pleased to note that since the launch of this pilot in April 2014, the number of living wage accredited employers has tripled. In addition, we are leading by example by ensuring that the living wage is a key part of Scottish Government's public sector pay policy. And although the Scottish Government is not able to set pay levels in the third sector or indeed the private sector and wider public sector in Scotland, where employees are not covered by our pay policy, we actively encourage all organisations to ensure all staff on lower incomes receive a fair level of pay. 
Through this, we seek to maximise household resources to tackle poverty and reduce inequality across Scotland. Thank you. Margaret McCullough. I uh, thank the Minister for her reply. Bluebird Care in South Lanarkshire has recently become one of the first care providers in my region to be recognised as a living wage employer. They expect to see the benefits to their business, including improved staff morale and better levels of worker retention. Regardless of whether the power over the minimum wage is devolved to Scotland, would the Scottish Government agree that there is nothing stopping them from promoting the benefits of the living wage to employers in sectors where work might be in the low paid or insecure area? And if so, do they agree that they could promote the living wage by establishing a living wage unit and introducing a living wage strategy for Scotland? Minister. Um, I'm very pleased to hear of the organisation in the member's constituency that has adopted the living wage and absolutely concur with what has been said about the benefits of any employer paying the living wage uh, to their staff. It does create better pro productivity and it values the workforce. Um, but I think I would say to the member also that given the fact that we now have a cabinet secretary whose one of the uh, main responsibilities is the living wage, uh, I think that indicates very clearly this government's position on the living wage. We funded the Poverty Alliance uh, to, to initiate the campaign uh, to, to promote the living wage. We continue to do so do so. Uh, as I said earlier, the Scottish Government pays a living wage across all its uh, employees and it also has a contract now has managed to, to negotiate with uh, th those that provide the catering and uh, uh, other services to the, the Scottish Government also to pay the living wage. So we are absolutely committed to it and will continue to do so and work towards it. Many thanks. Now call John Mason. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I mean, I, I, I accept the positive things that have been said about the living wage, but would the Minister accept that it is always second best? It is always voluntary at the end of the day, and it would be better if we had control of the statutory minimum wage. Minister. Yes, I, I would agree with the Member on that, and I think that that's, that featured in the Scottish Government's uh, submission to the Smith Commission. Uh, we do very much believe that having the, the, the power over the living wage, uh, the, the, the minimum wage, is the way forward. And we did say that also in the White Paper, that we could increase the, the minimum wage in line with inflation, which UK governments have failed to do so. Had they done so, our low-paid workers will, would already be £600 a year better off. So yes, absolutely, we would want to see uh, the power over uh, the minimum wage and setting the minimum wage here in Scotland. Thank you. James Kelly. Thank you. I think it's important to focus on the areas that the government's got responsibility for now. Labour recently highlighted the case of mighty cleaners uh, in Atlantic Key, Scot Scottish government location, and I welcome the fact that the government have moved on that and will now seek to ensure that those cleaners are paid the living wage. Can I ask the Minister if that policy will be extended to other cleaners coming under the public se sector, for example, CERCO in the NHS. Minister. I think it will be very clear that what I said, that this government is committed to the, the, the living wage and to ensuring that across all public sector employees that the government is responsible for and also negotiating uh, and working towards our, our good uh, workfare pro our good programme um, and in promoting uh, workforce matters throughout the Scottish Government and all the subcontractors and we are working towards that and that is something um, we continue to be committed to. We are absolutely committed to the living wage and I want to make it clear to this Parliament and to the country it is something that we are absolutely committed to, to doing and that is why we want to have the, the statutory powers here in Scotland over the minimum wage as well. We can increase it in line with inflation till eventually we do not require to have the living wage. Many thanks. Question to Drew Smith. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle high rents in the private sector. Minister Margaret Burgess. Uh, rents in the private sector reflect conditions in local housing markets, and there are wide variations in rent levels across Scotland. Where rents are high, the answer is to build more houses, and we have taken decisive action on this. We have boosted housing supply budgets by investing £1.7 billion in affordable housing over the lifetime of this Parliament. And just this month, we announced a £200 million increase in funding to stimulate Scotland's housing industry. We are also working with Homes for Scotland to attract new sources of investment to build more homes for private rent. 
Drew Smith. President, officer, nearly half of lets in the private sector are now occupied by families, and one in four of the poorest people are now having to rent privately. At the same time, we have seen rent rises in some areas of just 40% of 40 in just four years, meaning that many Scots are paying half of their monthly pay packet on rent alone. What reassurance can private renters in my area have that this government understands their predicament, particularly if there are no substantial proposals for action in this afternoon's legislative programme, and given the fact that the Minister previously failed to back rent reform when it was proposed by Scottish Labour? Mr. Um, as I said in my original answer, there is, um, lent, rent levels across Scotland are different, but on average the rent levels in cro across Scotland, and including uh, in the members' constituency in Glasgow, the average rent increases over the last four years have been less than the, in the, the increase of inflationary increase, uh, and that's across most of Scotland. There are some hotspots in Aberdeen and parts of Edinburgh uh, in Scotland where we are aware that rent levels are rising higher than inflation and we are looking at that. And we did commit and are at the moment consulting on that and that's part of our consultation on reviewing the private uh, sector tenancy and that's something that we are exploring as part of that is looking at rent levels uh, and I just would remind the member that when he said that, that Labour introduced it during the, the housing bill they introduced it at a very late stage during the housing bill and at a stage um, which they hadn't introduced it early on in the housing bill it wasn't introduced then it was not mentioned until, lo and behold, uh, they were allowed to mention it because Ed Miliband mentioned it in London. And it wasn't until then it was mentioned by Labour. Order. So I do think we were committed and we had already made a commitment. We had already made a commitment to review uh, the private sector uh, tenancy regime and rent levels, and we stuck to that commitment. Thanks. Question three, Liam MacArthur. To ask the Scottish Government when it expects to reach agreement with Orkney Islands Council uh, on the replacement of the island's internal ferry fleet. Mr Derek Mackay. In the Empowering Scotland's Island Communities Prospectus, published on the 16th of June 2014, we recognise that the provision of transport services should not place a disproportionate financial burden on any council, particularly with reference to revenue support for ferry services and ferry replacement costs for internal ferry services. We have since agreed to a programme of work with the local authorities involved, Orkney Islands Council, Shetland Islands Council and with the regional transport partnerships to consider this issue further and we are currently taking that work forward in partnership with those local authorities. Liam MacArthur. Can I thank the Minister for that uh, helpful response and also congratulate him uh, on his position and welcome in particular the appointment uh, of his uh, position and role as Minister for the Islands. The, the, the focus on new powers uh, is clearly welcome, but as he um, indicated in his response, uh, focusing on the powers we have, particularly in relation to transport, is vital. This is a long-standing issue, it, it, um, as the Cabinet Secretary, I think, will testify. Uh, will he agree to meet with myself and the local council to discuss how this can uh, be progressed in the interest of supporting some of the most vulnerable communities in Orkney for whom uh, these ferry services are a genuine lifeline? Minister. Uh, yes, uh, of course I will be happy to meet the member and uh, the local authority and others to take forward this uh, issue and I look forward to the, the ongoing work of the partnership and I particularly thank Liam MacArthur's constructive approach including welcoming my appointment as the logical choice. That is praise indeed and I look forward to the meeting we will conduct. Many thanks. Question four in the name of Jamie Hepburn has been withdrawn due to his ministerial appointment. Question five, Bob Doris. Um, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it seeks to promote affordable public transport for vulnerable groups. Minister Derek Mackay. Uh, Travel Line Scotland provides support for disabled people planning public transport journeys. Uh, over 1.25 million people have older and disabled persons passes, providing free bus travel. And the new ScotRail franchisee will provide a wide range of rail fare promotions, including for job seekers. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. In doing so, I also welcome to his new transport brief in, in the Parliament this afternoon. Also, uh, last month I hosted an awareness raising event in Parliament by Breast Cancer Care Scotland. They mentioned the difficulties that people living with cancer often have in accessing various services. In terms of transport costs, um, I was wondering um, if the Minister could look at potentially reviewing the cost in that area with specific reference to the concessionary travel scheme or perhaps even another mechanism by which this Scottish Government could seek to support 
transport cost-wise vulnerable groups such as those living with cancer and seeking treatment? Minister. Uh, a number of uh, people with long-term conditions will already qualify for the National Concessionary uh, Bus Travel Scheme. And those who are awarded middle and higher rate component care and higher rate mobility component of DLA or who receive attendance allowance or have progressive degenerative condition uh, insofar as illness or condition severely impedes their mobility uh, and ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities may receive uh, support. But in addition, we amended the regulations last year to allow those who will receive personal independence payments at both standard and enhanced rates to be eligible for the scheme. Now, we take care to keep options for the eligibility for the scheme under review. We have no immediate plans uh, at this time for any further changes, but I am happy to consider the detail further. Thank you. Briefly, Mark Griffin. Thank you. Mr Doris points out that hospital outpatients are one of those vulnerable groups, particularly those without access to a car. Now, according to Transport Scotland research carried out in August this year, only 54 per cent of those people thought that access to bus services were very or fairly convenient. How does the Minister plan to improve bus services between hospitals and communities for outpatients? Minister. Uh, well, I'm happy to look into this in further detail. Some, of course, the, the provision will be by uh, local authorities, some by transport partnerships and dedicated uh, schemes, including partnership schemes that I'm very aware of. So I'm happy to consider this matter further to ensure that uh, the transport solutions uh, are fit for those who rely upon them, including the most uh, vulnerable in our communities. Thanks. Question six, Hans Malik. Thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the number of households in temporary accommodation. Mr. Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government is reducing the numbers of households in temporary accommodation both by increasing housing supply and by preventing homelessness wherever possible through the development of housing options. Latest statistics indicate that in the first quarter of 2014-15, there was a 2% decrease in households in temporary accommodation on the previous year, and crucially, a 10% decrease in households with children in temporary accommodation. These falls are alongside wider falls in homelessness, more generally in Scotland in recent years. Thank you. Hans Malik. Thank you for the response, but householders are looking for results and not figures. There are still around 10,000 households living in temporary accommodation. What is the government doing to build more social rental housing stock to match the needs of household needs permanent accommodation so that householders are not stuck in temporary accommodation for long periods? The budget for affordable housing has been cut and is 25 per cent less than less in 2008 and 9. Will this reduction be realigned and or is the government satisfied to allow people to continue to suffer the way they are? Minister. I think I, I say two things to the member. The first thing to the member, while I, I do accept there, there are many families in temporary accommodation, the vast majority of the temporary accommodation is good quality local authority accommodation and well managed accommodation. And I think we, we have to, to look at that in the whole round. And in terms of the housing supply, we haven't increased the budget uh, throughout the year. We increased recently announced a further £200 million increase in the affordable housing budget for the, the coming uh, year. And also, I think we have to say that we're still building more houses for rent, social rent, than any other administration since devolution, and we'll continue, we're continuing to meet our targets on that, both in social housing and affordable housing. Many thanks. Question 7, in the name of Animal Ewing, has been withdrawn due to her ministerial appointment. Question 8, George Adam. To ask the Scottish Government what help and support is available to help veterans access housing. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, there is a wide range of help and support available to help veterans access housing. Uh, the Scottish Government has provided funding and support to a variety of new projects and housing developments for veterans, such as the Veterans, veterans Housing Facility at Cranhill in Glasgow, which was opened last month. We have produced a tailored housing guide for veterans and have also supported organisations which provide advice and support to veterans to help them understand their housing options. Other sources of help include the Scottish Government's low-cost initiative for first-time buyers, LIFT, the scheme which helps people on low to moderate incomes to access home ownership and is available to veterans, and also serving members of the armed forces and veterans who have left the armed forces within the past two years are provided with priority access to the LIFT schemes. George Adam. 
thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. I have been approached by many constituents in Paisley who live in vet uh, veterans' housing, which they do not feel is fit for purpose. A veteran's housing is often provided by charities. This means that they are not bound by the Scottish Quality Housing Standard. In these cases, what can be done to ensure good quality housing for our veterans? Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Housing Quality Standard is a target that ministers have set for all social landlords, including those registered social landlords that are also charities. If the landlord in question is not a social landlord, it will probably be subject to the repairing standard that applies to most private landlords. And private landlords who are subject to the repairing standard are required by the 2006 Housing Act to meet the standard throughout the life of a tenancy. Tenants of these landlords can apply to the Private Rented Housing Panel for assistance if their landlord fails to carry out repairs that are needed to meet the repairing standard. The panel can enforce repairs by issuing a repairing standard enforcement notice. If it is the case that the properties causing concern are not subject to the SHQS, I would encourage George Adam and his constituents to consider raising the concerns with the panel. Thank you. Briefly, Alex Johnson. During the passage of the recent Housing Bill, I took the opportunity to discuss with the Housing Minister the issues of allocation policies for social rented housing to those leaving the armed forces. I was assured at the time that uh, provision was in place that made uh, such additional moves unnecessary. Can the Minister tell me if there is a continuing assessment of the performance of the current Housing Act in relation to allocations policy for veterans and whether there is any prospect of changes being made to that process should it be proved necessary? Cabinet Secretary. I should say that in the discussions that we have had with veterans' organisations, what they have concentrated on is making sure that any disadvantage to them is eliminated rather than creating advantages for veterans. Uh, and uh, The member knows well enough, I think, some of the uh, local authorities which have been very proactive in this area, including Aberdeen uh, and Dumfries and Galloway, to mention uh, two. So we do keep this under review. I would also say, though, that perhaps the biggest issue are the armed forces. Uh, the MOD can, on the very day that somebody joins the armed forces, tell them that they are entitled to put their name down for a house when they leave the service. That still is not happening. We still have people coming out of the armed forces and having to start from that point on a waiting list. So I think there's more that can be done by the MOD. But of course, we do keep under review anything that we can do with the partners and local authorities to make sure that we can get uh, suitable housing for all of our veterans. Many thanks. Question nine, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made on the Dundee Port Railhead as recommended in the TAC Trans strategy. Mr Derek Mackay. Discussions on the feasibility of the Dundee Port Railhead are ongoing between TACTRAN and the freight industry and relevant stakeholders. We understand that at this stage a suitable business case is still to be developed. We are committed to encouraging growth in rail freight as evidenced by our £30 million fund on strategic rail freight investment which will be available over the next five years and the separate freight facilities grant scheme which supports the transfer of freight from road to more sustainable modes. And we'll keep this under review. Jenny Mara. I thank the Minister for his answer, but these discussions have been ongoing for years now between the Scottish Executive and the Scottish Government. The railhead has been costed at three to four million pounds, um, but decommissioning for Dundee, I've been leading a project on trying to bring decommissioning jobs to Dundee and holding weekly meetings with Scottish Enterprise, with Forth Ports and with Dundee City Council on how we can bring these hundreds of jobs to Dundee. The railhead is a key part of that infrastructure um, to allow um, materials to be brought to the port. Will the Scottish Government, considering funding the Dundee Railhead as a key part of this infrastructure to bring hundreds of jobs to our city? Minister. I am more than happy to offer a meeting with the member to explore the issues because the key issue here is private sector investment and developers will have a keen interest in this. I think it's a complex issue and we have to look at a actual demand for the railhead there. So if we want to look constructively at this issue, I'm more than happy to once again offer a meeting. Question number 10, Colin Keir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether there have been <coughs> discussions regarding bringing forward work on the rollout of superfast broadband for Kirkliston and South Queensferry, scheduled for late 2015. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. 
Uh, the Scottish Government is working with local authority investment partners and BT to bring fibre broadband to over 600,000 homes across Scotland over the next three years. Uh, given the scale of the engineering challenge and the major infrastructure works required, not all areas can benefit at the same time. There are no changes to report on the dates for the work schedule for Curtliston and South Queensferry. However, the programme is focused on maximising the efficiency of the rollout to optimise fibre coverage and improve deployment timescales across all areas of Scotland. Briefly, Mr Keir. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer and ask him if he agrees with me that areas such as Kirkliston have suffered thanks to the failure of the UK Government's Urban Broadband Fund, failure to comply with European state aid rules. Briefly, Minister. I am aware of and sympathise and sympathetic to the range of issues experienced by households and businesses with poor internet connectivity. We are working to address this and to provide improved connectivity to as many premises in Scotland as possible in the quickest possible time, including those in the most rural areas. The Government's Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme does comply with the European State Aid Rules, which state that an intervention can only be made in those areas where commercial market failure is demonstrated. The scheme is designed to optimise coverage and efficiency whilst ensuring there is equity across Scotland and that no areas are left behind. When the programme completes in 2017, over 95 per cent of Scotland will have access to fibre broadband. Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by the First Minister on the Scottish Government's programme for Government 2014.